Welcome back, folks, to the next episode of Revolution. I'm here with my friend and colleague, Dr. Rob Furman, up at uh, South Park Elementary in Pennsylvania. I'm Keith Reeves, joining you here from Yorktown High School in Arlington, Virginia. And uh, we were just wrapping up our last discussion about the idea of effectively the corporate ownership of the standardized testing situation um, and of schools um, and the effort to uh, infuse education with these you know, particularly corporate practices that are effectively um, change, trying to change and, and in some ways you may even say destroy the way that schools work in America. So we started riffing after the episode about how to create that meaningful change. One of the reasons that I got in contact initially with the Scrap the Map movement out in Seattle um, was because they were starting to do the kind of things that Rob and I just started talking about. How do you create meaningful change when the powers that be, the corporate governmental union, um, which I call in my book the standardized testing commercial complex, when the STCC owns American public education, how do you fight that? You know, the idea of the massive corporation against the individual has been a theme in American culture for decades now. Well, what can you do to fight against that? I think that people like Jesse Hagopian, um, who's an author, an activist, and an educator at Garfield High School out in Seattle, um, are kind of the initial point of the spear with what has become the United Opt Out Movement, the Badass Teachers Movement. These are grassroots organizations and efforts that are taking the fights to the streets. They're empowering and engaging parents, families, school leaders, um, local activists, wherever they can. I'm reluctant to say kids because I don't believe that adults should be co-opting children into a political movement. However, informed and engaged teenagers are absolutely starting to participate in meaningful ways and to participate in what is what amounts to civil disobedience. No, we will not take these tests. No, we will not engage in this. No, you cannot turn us into test taking revenue generating mechanisms. We're here for an education. One of the themes of United Opt Out um, is to create, and I want to make sure I quote this correctly, United Opt Out's effort to end corporate education reform is to uh, demand an equitably funded, democratically based, anti-racist, desegregated school system for all Americans that prepares students to exercise compassionate and critical decision making with civic virtue. That is absolutely incompatible with collecting oversimplified standardized data and standardizing kids, treating them as if they are all the same and acting the same way. Those are two incompatible values and ideas, which is why I think United Opt Out is starting to gain momentum. When you look at the difference between the way we've been schooling and the way we all we the way we know we all deserve to be schooled, they're very, very different. And I think that's why the opt out movements are gaining traction. Rob, have you been following anything with the opt out movements and testing there in Pennsylvania? Yeah, absolutely. And and I've got um various feelings on that. And so since you and I always agree on everything, I'm going to try to play a little bit on the other side um, because although to a certain degree I, I, I agree with the opt-out of, of standardized tests, I wonder if, again, the child gets hurt from opting out, not necessarily not because they're taking, taking a test or not taking a test, but will there, will there be fallout from administration? Will there be fallout from uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Ed, even though – they can opt out of taking our high stakes state test. Um, it, it, it ultimately favors favors negatively on the school and on the district because then we get that minus one, and then our then our school performance profile goes down the tubes, and then teachers end up it's part of their evaluation. Um, there's a part of me that agrees with the opt out. There's also a part of me that is concerned that if it's not if it's not a big movement quickly those kids that those individual revolutionists will end up getting themselves hurt. And that worries me. Um, also, I, I wanted to point out another, another concept that you were talking about with corporations. Um, I'm a member of the world future society, which is just an amazing group, highly recommend them. And um, what we do is we have conversations about education and all sorts of topics, bio, biomedicine, you name it. Um, but in terms of education, we look at about you know, 15, 20 years down the road. We try not to talk about too many things that are within the five to 10 year path um, because that wouldn't be quite as futuristic as, as, as the, the, deep, the deep distance. Um, so about five years ago, so we're looking at about 10 years from now, um, they predicted that schools 
would be owned by corporations. And in this respect, they will own a K-12 school district. They will create curriculum that produces the type of worker they want coming out of high school. They will then put them into a four-year college program that will once again create a worker for them and if you and if you take this which is basically free education k to k to post grad um you have to give them x amount of years working within the corporation um they have they have in effect created a drone that that is perfect for them now the the incentive is you don't have to pay for college the incentive is you're guaranteed a job coming out of college so all of those things that look so pretty on the surface but when you dig deeper into the concept of this corporate school, you've basically just been created, you've created a drone and, and you've created a, 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 a mold that's going to be repeated thousands and thousands of times. And it almost starts to sound like these dystopian books that I read where, you know, the world doesn't look the same anymore, that everybody's coming out. Uh, you know, look, go look at Fahrenheit, go read Fahrenheit 451, uh, go read uh, Wool and, and all of those type of dystopian books where uh, the, these these people are fighting against this. And meanwhile, to a degree, I'm almost seeing like it's sort of the beginning of creating here in, in our in our reality. And that's sort of scary. Uh, Keith? It, it should be scary. And that's exactly right. There is a fundamental disconnect between uh, futurists and and people who live in the present who are of corporate mindset. I hesitate to say the word capitalist, but really we're talking about uh, short-sighted immediate productivity. And you're right, the effort is, and I think always has been, and I think any meaningful survey, uh, uh, there's a book uh, Lawrence Kremen wrote about pr the progressivism and, and talks about the history of the 19th century American schools. This is not theoretical they said as much like corporations businesses said we need to create more workers in more factories why did and chris layman does a nice job of outlining this and i talk about it a little bit as well but why do we think that in the 19th century school many kids sitting the same way facing in the same direction with a leadership figure at the front moving from place to place with whistles and bells doing repetitive tasks that's a factory the whole thing is a factory so we should be totally unsurprised that that's precisely what we're doing now. Here's the thing that really kills me about that. If you start educating a child now, by the time they get done with their public schooling, basically for all intents and purposes, two decades have passed. Does anybody remember 1990? I mean, the world is a completely different place. The skill sets that we would have started preparing kids with in 1990, many of them don't apply. Is it any shock that we now have Twixters and kiddings, kids getting out of public school, going to college, and colleges going, what the heck do you guys know? The whole system fails to understand that we're now, I think it's Moore's Law, where you know technology doubles every, every year. We're so far ahead at this point, you can even look back to the videos that uh, Carl Fish was putting together five or six years ago, talking about the highest paying jobs, even those are far behind us now. We're so far moving ahead. If we only prepare kids with a present-based mindset and teach them the skills we need them to know now, all of our workers will constantly be behind. It doesn't make any sense. And if you ask businesses who aren't invested in corporate education reform what they want, communication, critical thinking, creativity, the ability to respond, the ability to collaborate, multiple languages. Those are skill sets. Those are creative and they're liberal arts skill sets. They're not teach a person how to do a job. I think it's a terrifying dystopian future to think that we would effectively usurp a person's individual, individualism, it's coercive by nature, will make them, as I say we, they'll make them into the drone, the worker that they want. They will obviously, in the scenario you're describing, give limited numbers of choices because they don't want you to pick astronaut. They want you to pick assembly line worker or electrical engineer, which even electrical engineer may sound fantastic. What if that's not what that kid wants to do? They're going to steer kids away from things that are liberal arts, arts in general, fine arts, creativity, music, the world doesn't need workers like that if you're a business-minded person, and steer them into roles where, oh, well, you can use that uh, personality trait or that skill, but they're still going to make you do what they want you to do. It's a very troubling vision. I think the converse, the thing we should be doing, 
and this goes along with our last episode, you can't standardize kids. If you want to say, let's have a set of standards, fine, have a set of standards that make sure that individuals are getting immersed in creativity, communications, critical thinking, analysis, um, synthesizing artwork, looking at literature, so that we do not continue to create a perpetuation of the historical structural violence that has always existed in American society between the haves and the have-nots. If we let corporate reform do what we're talking about them doing, we will perpetuate structural violence and continue to force kids, especially poor, poor kids and kids of color in schools that nobody gives a crap about, into these horrendously abusive and objectifying roles. I, I think it's terrifying and we should be scared. To go very briefly to the one thing I think that you said we do need to focus on is the revolution has to be at scale. It can't be individuals because these corporations will come in and slice the heads off of people that are doing that. That's why leaderless movements and massive movements, immediacy, organizing in secret, like the things they did on the West Coast, I think is going to be critical. Thanks, Keith. I, I want to. I, I think we'll end this with uh, with a statement that. Um, that always sort of sends a little chill up my spine being an educator. I think a lot of this, uh, this quote that I found sort of sums up everything that you and I are, are saying right now in terms of the, uh, the unfortunate short-sightedness of, of a lot of, uh, of educational systems. Um, this, this, is, this quote is from Author Unknown. It said, we are training students for jobs that don't yet exist, preparing them to use technologies yet to be invented and equipping them to solve problems that we don't yet recognize as an educator if that doesn't send chills up your spine then then maybe you're in the wrong profession <laughs> it's absolutely terrifying and yet absolutely thrilling and exciting at the same time and, and, and i hope by watching these episodes you sort of find your passion to to do the right thing and and to keep going on strong with these kids and remember what what Keith and I are saying is we can't we can't make a mold because that mold is not going to exist a year from now because technology and, and, and our world is just changing too quickly. Uh, this is Rob Furman signing off with episode four of Revolution. Keith, I'll give you an opportunity to say goodbye as well. Thanks everybody. Appreciate it. Follow me on Twitter at Reeves KD. Rob, pleasure as always. See you next time.